Alan Robinson is the head and the Raymond J. Lane Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Engineering Public Policy here at CMU. Uh, he received his bachelor's at Stanford and his PhD at Berkeley. He's been with us for several years, and we're delighted to have him here with us today, talking about the shale gas revolution, green energy, or a bridge to nowhere. One of those provocative titles. Alan. Anyways, it's great to be here. It's, it's always exciting to be talking about a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that's uh, natural gas and natural gas development and thinking about what that means for the environment. There's opportunities, but there are challenges. So I'll be talking about some of that today. This is a picture from one of the field studies we did. This is driving to a facility in Wyoming. You can see the natural gas facility there. I think this was a gathering facility. You can see some emissions coming off of it. And it was taken uh, from, uh, the, through the windshield of one of our mobile laboratories. I'll be talking about some of that data. But first, I want to talk about what motivates the work. And so if we think about the energy system in the United States, really the biggest transformation that's occurred in the last decade has really been the sort of natural gas boom. I mean, it's really incredible. And this data that I show up here is from the Department of Energy, and it shows the production of, of natural gas in the United States. And you can see before 2010, it was relatively flat, and then there's this big kink up. And they're predicting in the future just this dramatic increase in the amount of production of natural gas. So this is associated with uh, the ability to unlock the reserves that have been in these tight formations, these shale formations, using hydraulic fracturing and, and horizontal drilling. And this has really had a profound implication on our energy system in terms of thinking about our emissions of climate greenhouse gases as well as uh, traditional air pollutants and things like that. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. So it's, it's not been without controversy. And so this is a picture uh, of a protest in Philadelphia. There's a lot of people. It's been a very divisive issue thinking about the uh, hydraulic fracturing and that kind of technology coming into people's communities. There's a lot of concern. There's a lot of concern about what that might mean for water quality, what that might mean for local air quality, and things like that. And there's lots of interesting things to talk about that. And there are concerns, and there are legitimate concerns that need to be addressed. But I'm going to be talking more about climate today and thinking about the climate implications. And there, it, it, at least on the face of it, it might seem like a more clear-cut story, that it might be sort of a, a clear-cut win. And that's because the carbon intensity of natural gas is about half of that of coal. So essentially, per unit energy, you get half as much carbon. And then the other thing is that natural gas-fired power plants are generally a bit more efficient than coal-fired power plants. So the combination of those two things mean that if you go and measure the CO2 emissions from a, a power plant, you get about half as much CO2 from a natural gas-powered plant than you do from a coal-fired plant. And that's what the data up here shows. And these are data, again, from the Department of Energy. This is for an average, US average coal-fired power plant. So you'd be like, ah. Oh, well, maybe there's some controversy about water pollution or local air pollution associated with hydraulic fracturing. But the increased utilization of this natural gas uh, is leading to reduced greenhouse gas emissions, in particular CO2 emissions. And so that means that there's this climate benefit. So this is you know, something that's often accepted. And so you know, because of that, you might think, oh, well, you know, green energy, it's a pretty good thing. It's, it's helping us address the, the, the climate challenge. Well, then if we step back and we think about the, the data I just showed was data like right at the power plant, you know, making measurements in the stack of the power plant. But if you step back and think about all the stuff that it takes to get that natural gas to the power plant, there are wells and there's compressors and there's pipelines. And what about the emissions from all that activity? And is that something that we should be concerned with? Are those emissions significant? And that's the question. And that was the question that, that we have been working on. And the, question, and the answer is they can be significant. And so this is an infrared camera image of the Aliso Canyon. Uh, basically, there was a, this is a storage field that is outside of Los Angeles. And starting in October of this year, until very recently, uh, it was leaking substantial volumes of natural gas. From, basically, they had a, a well blowout, and it was uncontrolled. And the, this big storage field was just venting gas to the atmosphere. The climate impact of this leak was estimated to be about the equivalent of driving 7 million cars. So this is a substantial impact. This clearly is an extreme example. I mean, we don't have these types of emissions all the time. But if you take one of these IR cameras and go to basically any natural gas facility, you will detect leaks. Some of those leaks will be engineered vents that are part of the system. That's part of making a, a high-pressure gas system go. Sometimes you need vents. But some of them are fugitive emissions, where there's a leaky seal or something like that. 
So the question is, is you know, these, these big extreme leaks, but these smaller leaks, do they have an impact? And, and is that impact significant enough to erode the potential climate benefit of increased utilization of natural gas? So why might it? You know, it's like, well, it's a, you know, we have these leaks, but, you know, we still, you know, we're not leaking all the natural gas, right? We're just leaking a little bit. You know, is that really an issue? Well, the reason why it might be an issue is because there's a really big multiplier. If you think about, you know, the effect of these different gases on, on climate, it depends on how they absorb infrared radiation that goes back into space. So I have a couple little diagrams of molecules, of methane molecules on the left there. About 90% of natural gas is methane, so that's the dominant component. And there's a CO2 molecule. So they have different bonds and things like that. So they wiggle in different ways, and they absorb at different wavelengths of light. So it turns out the wavelength that methane is absorbing at makes it a much more potent greenhouse gas. So one way to characterize that is with something called the global warming potential, which is basically a ratio of the impact of a bit of methane relative to a bit of CO2, and you can do this for any gas. And you can see that in this diagram here, at, at a particular time horizon, methane is 25 times worse, or 75 times worse, excuse me, than, than CO2. So what does that mean? That means if you only have a few percent of the methane or the natural gas leaking from our, from our uh, natural gas system, that maybe that's going to be enough to offset those climate benefits associated with reduced CO2 emissions at the point of use. And that's because it's a much more potent greenhouse gas. Now, it's a little more complicated than that. The methane actually decays away in the atmosphere. And so the kind of multiplier you apply to methane actually decreases over time. And so, you know, depending on your, your employer, you may pick different values based on, um, uh, you know, how you want to make the natural gas look. And so if you ch choose a shorter time horizon, that's going to mean you can tolerate less and less leak rates relative to, to uh, using a longer sort of time horizon. So people have done this and done this kind of analysis. And so this was a, a paper that I first learned about actually reading the New York Times at my breakfast table in 2011. There was a story on the first page of the business section talking about the study that had come out of Cornell that said methane or natural gas electricity is worse than coal, basically from a climate perspective. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? And so what they had done is they'd gone and estimated all the methane emissions that were occurring throughout the natural gas system and, and, and put them on a CO2 equivalent basis. And that's the sort of dashed red bar. And there's a lot of these emissions, upstream emissions, they were claiming. And oh my gosh, it's worse than coal. And so one of the things that we felt confident that we were potentially getting this climate benefit associated with switching the natural gas may not be true. So this got, not only did I read it at my breakfast table, but there was a lot of coverage of this paper and this topic, right? It was sort of like poking the hornet's nest. And there were lots of articles, New York Times, Washington Post, Scientific American, et cetera. You can just sort of Google around 2011 uh, about this particular paper. And there was a lot of interest about what the issue was and trying to think about, you know, was this true? Was really switching from coal-fired power to natural gas-fired power actually worse for climate? And that, if it's true, that seems like, uh, you know, ooh, one of those things that we thought was true was not. So it turns out that the leakage rate matters. And so I'm just going to illustrate with this one little slide. It's a simple little figure. It's got years to climate benefit. It's got percent leakage rate. So this is saying how many percent of the natural, of the natural gas transported throughout the United States is sort of leaked into the atmosphere. So this line is for a coal. So if you substitute natural gas for coal, if you fall on this line, if say at year zero, if there's a 4% leakage rate basically, basically it's a push. They have equal climate impact on a zero year time horizon. Then as you go out to later years, you can tolerate larger leakage rates because that impact, that multiplier factor is going down over time. So if we look at it, right, if we're above the curve, it's gonna be worse than coal. If we're below the curve, we're better than coal. So if you look at these different estimates, this estimate that came out from that paper that I showed earlier from climactic change was estimating about 8% leakage rate. It's like incredible. 8% of the natural gas produced in the United States leaked to the atmosphere. And that's kind of a mind-boggling number. But that's what they were claiming based on the data that they had. Other estimates, say if you looked at the EPA estimate, it was about 1.5% was leaking into the atmosphere. So clearly there's a big range between 1.5% and 8%. And of course, the curve that we're interested in is right between them. And so whether or not we get benefits or disbenefits depends on what the actual leakage rate is. And so we sort of saw this and sort of said, hmm, what's the problem? Well, it turns out there are a lot of data gaps that a lot of these estimates were made literally back of the envelope with relatively little emissions data. And a lot of that emissions data was very old. It had been collected 
a couple of decades ago. And the natural gas system has really changed a lot in the last two decades. There's a lot more production. There's a lot of different types of compressors and all this sort of stuff. So we decided to put together a, a big effort to go and try to nail down this issue a little bit and try to go out and make measurements at facilities and make updated national estimates to try to get a sense of, you know, what is this leakage rate? And why don't we address these data gaps? And if you looked at the data, you know, they're estimating the emissions from the gathering sector, and they had two gathering facilities measured, and we're going to take that and extrapolate it to 5,000 facilities. Seems insane, but, you know, it's, it's, you got to start someplace. So we put together a team to go out and measure this, and it, we got support from federal agencies, we got support from companies, we got access, we've done a lot of work, and I'll talk a little bit about that work and about some of the things that we found, and then circle back in terms of thinking about what we found, what it means, and on this question of sort of methane leakage and climate, and then kind of come back and take a, a big, bigger pic picture perspective on it. So what did we do? Well, we went out and we said, we got to get some more data. We got to go out and we got to measure emissions from a lot of facilities. So this was one of the magical mystery tours done by a group from Carnegie Mellon. It took 10 weeks. We started here in Pittsburgh. They spent a couple of weeks bouncing around the Marcellus, characterizing uh, emissions from the Marcellus facilities. Then they went down to Arkansas, spent a week in Arkansas characterizing emissions, then to Texas, Gulf Coast, up to Oklahoma, up to Wyoming, and then back to Pittsburgh. So it took 10 weeks. You know, this particular trip, they probably measured emissions from about 75 facilities. And we did multiple ones of these. And the point is, we tried to get nat uh, national coverage. We tried to hit important producing basins. We hit important pipelines and things like that to really get a representative sort of national study. What did we do? We did different types of measurements. We did on-site measurements. You can take these infrared cameras. Remember I was that infrared camera image of the Aliso Canyon? There's one of a, of a, of a tank battery at a, at a facility. You can see the picture on the left there. Shows, you know, nice blue sky, beautiful day. And it turns out if you look at that with an IR camera, oh my gosh, there's a lot of methane and other gases that are coming out of that facility from a valve. And then you can go up and use a man lift to go up there and measure those emissions and things like that. So we did these kind of direct on-site measurements to understand where the emissions were coming from. And then we also did some downwind measurements where you drive downwind, measure the plume, and you can use an atmospheric model to infer what the emission rates for that. So we've got these kind of independent measures to try to help us understand and give us confidence in the data. So what did some of it look like? This is one of our, our vans. We've got the pirate flag going out there, driving around some dirt road out in the west, chasing a methane emission plumes. It's pretty fun. Sometimes it wasn't so fun. This particular van, they said, looked at this road and said, oh, we could do it. And they went down this road. Turns out they couldn't do it. And they had to get the farmer to drive them out. And that, that sort of cost us a new engine. That was a little bit disappointing. But you know, that's uh, all in the sake of science. You know, here's a picture giving you a sense of what some of these facilities look like. You, know, you go to one of these stations with compressors. There'll be a bank of 10 of these things. This is the radiator on it, one of our teams you know, posing in front of that. Big equipment, fun, real engineering. Uh, oh, there's a, you know, towards the end of the study, this was after a hard week in the field, you know, at a processing plant in Wyoming or something like that. Just giving you a little sense of kind of what it looks like out there, what some of these facilities look like and things like that. So how about the data? So we'll just do a couple little slides looking at data. So here's one slide of data, and this is just from gathering. So this is like a snapshot of the hundreds of facilities that we looked at. So these are facilities from gathering. So the gathering sector, you have wells, you have the interstate transmission system, and the gathering sector takes the gas from all the wells and gets it to the interstate transmission, transmission system. And often there's processing plants in there that, that remove impurities from the gas to get it up to kind of pipeline spec. So these are a bunch of gathering facilities. I think there's data for about 100 gathering facilities. Remember, the previous estimate was based on data for two gathering facilities. So we've increased the amount of data by about a factor of 50 here. Um, and you can see, well, what do you, what do you see when you look at the data? Well, on the, the y-axis there is emission rates. You can see the emission rates vary really widely from hundreds of kilograms per minute to you know, a tenth of a kilogram per minute. If you look at this at a leakage rate, for some facilities we can see half the gas going into the facility was actually leaking into the atmosphere. That's the exception, not the rule. But it's really a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of variability. And to try to get at that, you need to characterize enough facilities. So what if you put the facilities and you represent them as a sort of a, a distribution? And this is a distribution that's comparing the sort of cumulative fraction of emissions that we measured across some set of facilities. Each line represents a different sector. The blue line is the production sector. Some of these other lines are processing, gathering, transmission, and storage. This is kind of all our data. 
took a lot of work to get this data. And what do you see? These are distributions. And essentially what this data are showing is that really a small fraction of the facilities are disproportionately contributing the emissions. And so what this shows, say, in the, in the processing sector is 20% of, or, or the production sector, is 20% of the production sites are contributing about 80% of the emissions. And so if you're thinking about developing policies, you're thinking about, well, how can we get that, that 20%? Is there a way to get those, that 20%? Uh, if we could, I mean, that might be a, the most efficient or economically efficient way to achieve some emission reductions. And we saw that characteristic across the different sectors. So what was causing the emissions often that these high emitting facilities? It often was some kind of malfunction that was going on and often the, the emissions were, were relatively easy to fix. So here's an IR camera image of a, of a tank battery. I don't think it's the same one that we sort of showed before. It doesn't show up very clear. So this is what it looks like you know, to, to a, a human's eye or something like that. And you, not much is going on. It doesn't appear very well here. I think we're going to change the contrast in a second and you'll see you know, natural gas sort of uh, or methane coming flowing out of this, this, va this vent, this is an engineered vent on top of the tank farm. You can see it coming off there. So this was one of these high emitting facilities that we saw. Turns out there was something called a dump valve that was stuck and the guy went over and kicked it and unstuck it and then it stopped emitting. And it's not always that easy, but often there's these types of things that, that can, that can uh, be, you know, uh, you know, that are relatively easy to sort of address. So we took all these numbers. These were the emissions numbers. I didn't talk about the activity numbers. You know, we spent time counting facilities. It was actually not very glamorous. But you know, we don't even really know how many wells are out there, how many gathering stations. I mean, really basic stuff we need to know. We spent a lot of time working on that. And by combining that, you can come up with national estimates. And I'm just going to show it for the gathering system here, but we've done it for the other sectors as well. So the size of the little pie, or the, the pie there, is 2,400 gigagrams. Hmm, that doesn't, that doesn't make much sense to me, but 2,400 gigagrams, that's a pretty big number. Giga seems like a big prefix. Yellow is from gathering. Red is from processing. So how does this vary, differ from what, say, EPA was estimating? Well, there's the EPA estimate, so our estimate's about twice as high. And then the other thing is you look at where the emissions are coming from. We really think they're coming from gathering. From our data, hundreds of facilities suggest that it's really coming from gathering and not necessarily from processing. So if we want to think about where do we want to target our emission reduction strategies, having that kind of granular information is important. So our estimate says it's higher. So if we come back to this figure, sort of kind of looping back, is there sort of climate benefit associated with natural gas? What's the leakage rate? So remember the green line is sort of the, the break-even point between coal and gas. There's the EPA estimate and there's the Howarth estimate. So our estimate, of course, falls right in the middle. So, um, you know, sort of there's some truth in both is what we would say. Our estimates certainly suggest that there is benefit, even from, say, year zero from the switch to natural gas relative to coal. But is that really the right question? And that's getting in here to the last slide and thinking about you know, what we need to do to sort of stabilize climate. And so this is maybe an updated graph from that Howarth study. And so what it shows is the green and the black are the CO2 emissions at the end use at the stack of the power plant. And then the red hashed area is the additional CO2 equivalent emissions associated with methane. And you can see the red bar is much smaller now because we don't think the emissions are nearly as high. It's just a, it's about 2 to 3% of the gas is being leaked, not 7 or 8%. But is that really the right question? And so just the fact that the natural gas bar is shorter than coal, is that really good enough? Is that really what we need? And if you think about what's going to be required to stabilize atmospheric CO2 concentrations, it's really dramatically lower emissions than that. This is when we talk about the emissions, say, from the United States or globally need to reduce to, say, 90% of 1990 levels or something like that. That's the kind of reduction that we need to stabilize atmospheric CO2 concentration. So I've sort of drawn a little bar. You wouldn't necessarily think about it on an individual power plant basis, but I've drawn a bar here sort of at 90% less. And so it's not clear that, well, I know natural gas doesn't get us there. Right? And if we're thinking about these investments that we're making, we're making substantial investments in our national, natural gas infrastructure. These investments are going to last for 50 years, and it's not clear that we can, we can um, you know, the climate can tolerate 50 years of really high natural gas use because it's not going to get our CO2 emissions low enough. Methane is important, but it's a little bit second order, I think, relative to that particular point. Anyway, so thanks for your attention. This is the study team. This is another big source of of methane, which are cows, and that's a different topic. But anyways, thanks, everybody.